Fast Money starts right now. We've got breaking news. Uber pricing its IPO just moments ago. Let's get straight to Leslie Picker back in the newsroom for all the details. Leslie. Hey, Melissa. According to a source, Uber has priced its IPO at $45 per share. That gives it an implied fully diluted valuation of about 82 Point four billion dollars. Now that forty-five dollars per share number makes it about a dollar above the low end of the range it had been marketing to investors. That range forty-four dollars uh, to fifty dollars per share. Now we're not sure at this time uh, because all of this pricing talk is based on uh, people familiar with these discussions. We're not sure if they've changed the number of shares they plan to offer in the deal. But if it is still the same, one hundred and eighty million, uh, the offering size would be about eight point one billion dollars making it the largest IPO of 2019 thus far. Obviously, this one very heavily anticipated. Uh, hearing in terms of kind of the pricing discussions and why they chose to price it at $45 per share, which is pretty rare to see, especially with a large tech name and a unicorn that's been heavily anticipated uh, for many years at this point. I'm told that $45 per share was the price by which they could get uh, the best number of investors, of institutional investors, uh, into this book, which they hope means that those institutional investors will hold through till tomorrow. Of course, uh, Time will tell. They begin trading tomorrow morning. Back over to you. Leslie, when you mentioned it's not clear whether or not they adjusted the number of shares they were actually offering, mm -hmm. is it thinking that perhaps they actually increased the offer even though they price at the low end? It's doubtful that they've increased it or upsized the deal as it's kind of known in the IPO world just because if they were going to do that we would likely see more pricing toward the higher end of that range. Uh, but I just haven't been able to confirm for sure that the number of shares that they've been offering has stayed the same. So I just wanted to make it clear for viewers that we don't know for sure yet. Uh, but there should be a press release out uh, imminently which will spell out the exact details for the number of shares that have been offered in this IPO. All right, Karen's got a question yeah, for you. Question. Let's say we have very bad trade news tonight. Mm -hmm. Is there any chance that they pull this offer, move it to I don't know when, but not, that they don't close and we don't see trading tomorrow? I would I would say there's always a chance for anything to happen, but usually once they've set a price and they've already decided to allocate these out to investors, there's a press release that comes out. Investors are expecting to get those allocations. It's very, very, very unlikely that they actually pull this. And remember, this is $8.1 billion for this company. They need this cash because they are burning through cash. So the sooner they have it, the, the quicker they can get back to building their business um, and getting on with everything. Um, so I would say there is always a chance that ev you know anything can happen, but I, I would say it's very unlikely at this point. All right, Leslie, thank you. Leslie Picker with the latest on Uber. Let's get to Bob Bassani at the New York Stock Exchange with some more reaction. Bob. Well, I think the important thing is the IPO market has been spectacular this year, with the exception of Lyft. So we've had Beyond Meat, Zoom Video, Jumia, Pinterest, Levi Strauss, all trading well above their initial prices. Lyft is the one exception. And there are some particular issues with Uber. The size of the offering is just enormous. It loses money. Lyft has traded poorly. And I think just referenced a few moments ago is the market conditions. This is a very, very tricky deal. Remember, we were talking 44.50, and a couple of days ago it was 47, 48. They're pricing at 45, and that's the prudent thing to do. You have two problems here. You have somewhat squishy demand, not entirely clear, but somewhat squishier than anticipated. And number two, you have extreme market volatility. When you have these two conditions, squishy con demand, extreme market volatility, the prudent thing is price at the very low end. Look what could have happened. $47, $48 they would have priced that. Suppose tonight we get a tweet from the president say, unfortunately, we're at an impasse on trade negotiations. The Chinese delegation is go home. We open down 500 points tomorrow morning. Uber could price significantly, could start trading significantly below $47, $48 and may close there. If you price it at 44 or 45 and you get, well, we've got a reasonable deal or we've got some agreement to continue to negotiate, it could trade up much higher. But if you don't, and the market's down 500 points, you could at least make a reasonable argument to everybody out there saying we should close very close within that initial range, say 44 or 45. And with the markets down 500, you close right there. That would be a victory for you. In other words, yeah. they're doing the prudent thing at this point. Melissa. Sure. 
Bob, thank you. Bob Pisani from the New York Stock Exchange. You can't control market volatility, certainly, but in terms of this notion of squishy demand, the technical term that Bob just used, I mean, part of that is, is it seems like from the time that Uber went public to now, there is an increased focus on the fact that these companies are losing lots of money in order to just operate their businesses. For the time that Lyft went public. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so no, you, absolutely. And what does it mean for the retail investor? And again, I think. Most people in the United States have heard of Lyft. They've, I've never been in one. I drove one one day, as you yes. recall. But they heard of it, so they felt they knew something about it, whether they did or not. So I think a lot of retail folks got into stock day of the IPO, day after, in the 80s, in the high 70s. Now they wake up, it's a $55 stock, and they're saying to themselves, rightly or wrongly, you know what, this game is in fact rigged. I'm not going to play in the stock market anymore. I think that's really detrimental to consumer confidence in terms of the market. So maybe Uber will be better or it'll, it'll trade better. But I think Lyft left a lot of people uh, licking their wounds, and I think it's going to take a long time to get them back. Yeah, I think the real problem with this is that the path, this so-called path to prob profitability, is might be non-existent here. I mean, it's really difficult to understand how Uber and Lyft are going to compete and actually make some money here because they don't right now. They lose an awful lot of money. So to me, the path to profitability looks like this looks like a, a long walk off a short pier for these folks. Well, and by the way, guy, great that you, st you kept the pink mustache on your bumper. Yeah, well, mm -hmm. from it's important. That's nice. So, so you talk about the losses here. They, Uber going into this IPO has lost 3.7 billion in the 12-month calendar into their IPO, which is the largest loss going into an IPO ever. Uh, for a company that's raised $20 billion in debt and equity, largest ever. Um, so, and think about the people that want to go out and buy this stock. Well, it's not BlackRock. It's not some of the biggest institutions in the world. They own it. So, I mean, there's some issues with this IPO that I think are very different than what we've ever seen. By the way, the largest IPO since Alibaba. So um, it's a case where I think people are very concerned about insiders. There was something in the prospectus that indicated that, by the way, um, a risk factor was added. Not that the company will never make money, which a guy brought up, which is, which is a fair one to be concerned about. <laughs> but but that, that, that people, that insiders could be engaging in hedges, short selling, or some types of transactions that will allow them to get liquidity before the lock update. So we're talking about massive amount of stock. We're talking about an IPO that at one point was going to be $100 billion, is now pricing around $82 billion. You've got insiders that have been watching the bottom drop out. And that should worry investors, because I think that's the biggest issue with IPOs. Uh, good for them for, for just listening to the market and not trying. I mean, maybe this is jamming it down the throats of that, <laughs> even at this price. I don't know. But good for them as the roadshow went on and the markets were rocky and interest seemed to wane. Good for them to, to do it at a price to get done. Like these gentlemen, I don't get it. I don't get the model. We were talking in the green room. How, what do they really own? What is this? Is the, it's not drivers. It's, not, it's, right. it's the network, which they share with a lot of people overlapping uh, with with Lyft, and so I don't. I really don't get it. We've seen a lot of companies that don't make money to start. At 83 billion dollars, a lot of things have to go really, really right around the world, you know. And I, I mean, maybe Uber Eats is the be-all, end-all. I don't know. I, I'm so skeptical of it, and I feel like you know, just looking at the S1, who's selling? So you have about 1.3 or 4 billion of 688 million is insiders like executives of the company. Another six, seven hundred million is, you know, all the VC funds. I kind of think of SoftBank selling any, which they're selling a little. They still, granted, they still own a, a ton. But if SoftBank would even sell some at this price, oh my God, I don't want to own it. I, I just, not at this price. I mean, good for them for, for getting it done, but I, I feel very comfortable staying away. If they end up finding a magic beans to make money, great. That's good for them. I feel like there are a lot of bears on this desk when it comes to this particular <laughs> issue. Um, but to play devil's advocate, I mean, some people compare this to an Amazon, where an Amazon didn't oh. own necessarily. At that okay. point in time, when they went public, it was the magic of the connection of the platform that connected buyers and sellers. They didn't okay. actually you know, carry, in, they connected the third right. part, you know, other. Look, can I just address that for one sec? Just looking. You're right. like staring at me like, no way, that's a bad. <laughs> You're addressing it yeah, as no, you are. I'm just all, you know, I looked at Amazon. Here's one that went, didn't, went public, obviously wildly successful beyond anyone's imagination. And just looking, when they did 11 billion of revenue, which is where Uber did uh, last year, Amazon actually made money that year. They had positive cash flow. They made money. They traded their enterprise value was 14 or 15 billion dollars and they made money here uber is losing tons of money at 83 billion dollars
the okay. comparison is so not good not in your favorable. view. I mean, Uber's in the delivering people business. Amazon right. is delivering, delivering things goods. business mm -hmm. to people. I don't know. It, I, I don't get the math. Yeah. It just really comes down to, and I don't, I don't get it either, and obviously Lyft is telling you, I think, everything you need to know in terms of how um, enthusiastic the investment community is. But I think it speaks to a broader issue is, is our, the confidence of the retail investor being eroded, seeing how poorly. I know Bob spoke about how well Levi has done in Pinterest, but I think most Zoom. people, again, 99% of the people out there have heard of Lyft and heard of Uber, and if they see these things trade poorly after they've purchased stock at crazy levels, I think it's going to really keep them on the sidelines. I think in terms of market sentiment, that's a really bad thing.